Hey everyone, it's Russell again. Uh, welcome to the Russell Wong Chats. And uh, yeah, I've been slacking, so we haven't done nothing for two weeks. Um, but the next one up, you know, it's a really close friend of mine and, and uh, I'm glad she can do it. You know, uh, she could do it and um, she's in town. So uh, we have a lot to talk about and we'll share some great stories because it was just, you know, we've been friends for a long time. So, and of course you would know her definitely. And, you know, people here in Singapore, we see her quite a bit because she flies in and out quite a bit and we shoot quite a lot. So I, wa I want to welcome, here we go, all the way from California. Welcome, Joan. Hello, Russell. How are you? Fine, 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 fine. We're all okay here in Singapore. And you're, you're, you're okay there in California? Yeah, we're all right. All right. Yeah. This year, but yeah, we're all right. That's good. No, this I just wanted to share. You know, I mean, people know that we are good friends. You know, for so long, and and we've shot so much together, and just just I wanted to share just a lot of the stories that you know we we, we speak about, we chat about. You know, from the time I knew you. But the funny thing is, I I I never really asked you, and I don't really know the details about. You know, we had never really spoke about the details of you growing up in China. You know, mm -hmm. and I've always found that really intriguing because I've you know I've seen you speak. The other interviews and just what was it like when you were growing up in, in China and how did it move over to the acting, uh, you know, for you acting? Okay, no wonder you said an hour. Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, going up, growing up in China, obviously, um, I was born in the 60s, growing up in the 60s and 70s. It's during a cultural revolution. So we're very, um, we were closed off from the rest of the world. Yeah. And so our world was very small. Um, and um, I didn't know what my life was any different from anybody else's life until I uh, left China and saw other ways of life. Um, pretty much almost everybody in China lived more or less the same kind of life. Um, it was hard, you know, food was scarce. Um, we had two change of clothes for each season, never anything more. I mean, that's already lucky. I mean, in, in some poorer countrysides, it's even worse. Um, but I never felt, um, poor. I never felt, um, because everybody was the same. I see. Yeah. And, um, we didn't get to choose our future. Basically you, um, you read what's given to you in school and then um you will be assigned a job later on in your life um regardless of your interest so we never really thought about the future um so it was pretty um carefree in that sense um school was not hard it was not important it was more, it was more important that we um, we read Chairman Mao's red book and memorize it and um, behave in the most politically correct manner and nothing else was important. I see. I mean, it's it's kind of uh, you know, it's like what you don't know won't hurt you, pretty much. You yeah. know, what you don't know that's not that's not out there that you never experience yeah. you don't exist so you, it's just yeah. uh I, I think that, that that's that sums it up right but but i know i know you were kind of born into a very would i say you know kind of would you say privilege because your grandparents were doctors your mom and dad were doctors so you didn't come from like no, a, yeah. a, a no, typical um, family i right? wasn't privileged yeah. i wasn't privileged because life's more or less you, you eat the same thing almost, but yeah. you know, like we wear the same clothes like everyone else, uh, yeah. but they were um, top intellectuals of the country, you know, really uh, well-educated. And so 
my both my grandparents studied um, in England and in the United States. Wow. Um, so that's grand. That's grandma right there, right? Yeah. That's my father's side grandmother. Okay. Um, and then my father and mother and me. That's in my grandmother's house um in the backyard we yeah. used to go every sunday to go visit uh, my father's site grandparents mm -hmm. um about three buses three bus stop away from like uh my parents home which is my maternal grandparents home okay and so we had at least we had houses we had both my my father's side, mother's side, their parents had their own houses. I see. Um, so that, you know, that's in a way privilege that you say, you know, um, but um, during the Cultural Revolution, um, where my home was, five different families actually moved into our house. Wow. Yeah, so each room was occupied by a different family. Okay. For like about seven, eight years. Yeah. I see. And how, you know, I mean, how how did the acting, uh, how did that come about? I mean, when you were, was it in high school, if you were 14 or something or? I was first year high school and I was 14. Uh, I was in a rifle team and- A rifle team? I was in the rifle team. Our school had a rifle team. Oh, okay. And so um, I liked it. Um, it was a fun sports. Um, this is all in Shanghai, Joan, right? Yeah, this was all in Shanghai. Okay. And um, then one day, a casting director um, who saw a photo from an aunt of mine um, said, oh, you know, she's, she's interesting. What's she doing? And um, my aunt said, she's in school. And okay. so the casting director wanted to meet me after, I see, I see. Um, they, after she saw the uh, photo. And so we, I had no idea. Like I never <laughs> even thought about acting before that. I, I, I didn't know what that was. Um, never dreamed of it. But uh, she met me and we chatted a little bit. Um, and she thought I had hope. I see. Profession. So is this is this a picture? Yeah, this is the picture. Yeah. So, so this was in this this was in high school, and it was just a snapshot by by mom or something. No, it was not. Um, during that time, it so happened that my brother Chase, okay, who, Chase, who, okay. yeah, who who was studying um, painting, drawing and painting, um, with a very famous teacher, and so his colleagues they were making. Oh, I should have given you the other picture. They okay. were um, they were making artwork, revolutionary artwork. I see. Both sculpture and also painting. And so they needed models. Okay. So, so they ah. took the series picture because they knew me through my brother. And okay. uh, so they took a series of pictures to um, use different angles of the face, you know, to put into a revolutionary painting. I should give you one. That's actually really, really a lot of fun. So these were, I see, I see. So like how did the, so the casting director comes mm -hmm. and the casting director picks you to mm -hmm. study acting. Mm -hmm. Well, what, no, what, yeah. she, she picked me and uh, she picked me. She said, I would like you to meet some of my colleagues. I got so it. So okay. we had a date to go to Shanghai Film Studio. And um, I was thinking, oh my God, this is a big deal. I'm going to Shanghai <laughs> Film Studio. I uh, never thought of it before, but I got nervous. And I was yeah. like, okay, I had two sets of outfit. It, it's it's either sp spring or autumn. It's, it's <laughs> one of those comfortable weather clothes. 
Um, I have two. I have one that's a fake sort of a, a faux army um, jacket. And the other one is more feminine. And uh, the army jacket had a, a big rip um, that was sewn together badly. So it kind of looked bad. Yeah. But in a whole, it, it looked more revolutionary. Okay. More shapely. So we decided maybe still that was that that would be the right one. And so went to the studio and then I met like six, seven different other casting directors or directors in an office. And they were just looking at me. And this was like such a strange feeling. Um, and then they said, oh, can you sing or dance or do something for us? Um, and I wasn't in the dancing team. I wasn't in the singing team. I was in the rifle team. <laughs> so I, I had nothing that I could um, just show them in an office. You know, I was also the person responsible for the Blackboard post each week. You make drawings and writing. Um, the political propaganda messages on the blackboard, but that's a skill I couldn't show off either. And so something came to my mind and I said, I know how to recite Chairman Mao's Serve the People, which is a very, very long article that Mao wrote. I said, I could recite that in English. Wow, in English. Yeah, because I was studying broadcast English. They were just beginning to teach. They were beginning to teach broadcast English um, in the um, ra on the radio. So I they see. were teaching on the radio each day, and so I was learning on the radio, and it was a translation of the mouse work. Wow. So it was very long, and so I was very proud that I have learned it. So I volunteered that, and nobody obviously understood what I was saying. But and they didn't understand. I, I, I wing it. I and so that's how I got in. I see the the. So which part of it? So when you got in, I mean, there's a story that 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 Chairman Mao's wife saw you or met you or picked you or something. What what was that? What when, when did that happen or how did that happen? So after they saw me and they decided I had something for the screen. Um, there was this movie beginning in Shanghai Film Studio that was like Mao's wife was producing three different movies. It's a it's a long march trilogy. Okay. And uh, there is one of the three movies called Jing Gang Shan. It's Jing Gang Mountain. Um, and it, it's assigned to Shanghai Film Studio. And they have, um, Mao's wife have decided on the leading man, on the director, and on the studio. And uh, my character was more on the minor side, not the leading character. So um, then they sent my material to her for approval. Okay. And that's how, and so we had preparation, rehearsals, and then we stopped shooting all of a sudden. I didn't understand. So I was being told by the producer all of a sudden one day, I was like practicing so hard because I had to say a line, tears streaming down my face. And I said, Jinjiang Mountain is lost. Um, and I was so stressed out and, and working so hard. And then one day I was called into the office and the producer said, um, I'm sorry to inform you, but we will cancel this production. And I mean, I didn't know then that was a bigger political movement behind it. So, okay. you know, half a year or so later, Mao's wife was arrested. Yes. And that was the downfall of the Gang of Four. And I didn't know it back then. I was very disappointed, relieved and disappointed. Um, and then um, 
the producer said, well, I bet you don't want to go back to high school. I said, I really don't. He said, you know, people are supposed to go back to their work unit or school when the production is not going on because you're not uh, formally hired as a staff in our studio or as a actor in our studio. Um, it's a studio system. So you basically, you actually, once you're hired, you, you're there forever. Yeah. Okay. Um, like the old fashioned way of just yeah, yeah. Contract, contracting the actors, right? Yeah. And so then he said that I was practicing in the hallway every day. This very famous actress saw me and uh, admired my uh, spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Were okay. you reciting? Were you reciting another speech or something, or what was? <laughs> I was trying to recite the speech. I was trying to squeeze tears out of my eyes, saying that line. And I was trying to be really hard every day, and she, she saw it, and so she was starting a class. So she had spent. They spent like about ten months recruiting from the workers, peasants, and soldiers to get students to become actors. And so she said um, she could add me into that class. So that's when I became formally hired uh, by the Shanghai Film Studio. I see, I see. And how did, uh, you know, of course, your you know, most famous role then was, was Xiaohua, right? The Little Flower. Um, she, how did that come about? Yes. Um, so I was in the acting school and after a few months in the acting school, the cultural revolution ended. Okay. And uh, there is a Shanghai film studio director named Xie Jing. He was like, he was the best director in China, a great storyteller. Um, so he was, going to make a film and uh, needed a young girl. So she came to our, he came to our acting school and picked me. And so that was a film uh, called Youth. Um, I think it, I think Youth is, was his worst film. And his <laughs> long, long um, um, celebrated career. Uh, anyway, so I played this, deaf girl, this deaf and mute girl from the countryside who wanted to be a communications soldier. <laughs> and somehow she was cured um, by acupuncture. Um, it's kind of a ridiculous story, um, but I, I got this part. It's a very difficult part because you play a deaf and mute. And that was first time and he was the best teacher. So that film um, was just being shown in China when they were casting for Xiaohua. I see. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, when 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 you when you got when you got Xiaohua, it I mean it read pretty much, you know, made you so famous as a child star. You know, yeah. you were like the list you like the Elizabeth Taylor of China. And I remember you saying that, yo, you were mobbed when you were walking outside. Everyone knew who you was. How old were you then, Joan? When you did I, when... I started Shanghai when I was 17, so I'm not really a child. Okay. Um kind of high school, end of high school. Mm -hmm. And um yeah. So there you go. So she, and uh and um so from from then, I mean, how like as a kid growing up in China, you got a whole billion people there. Everyone knows you. How did how did that feel? I mean, how did I mean, it, how did you even process it, it? You know, it felt very strange because it wasn't yeah. it wasn't something I understood. It wasn't yeah. something I pursued. It wasn't something I understood, and it was just uncomfortable. And I don't have the kind of personality that could actually enjoy this type of thing. Yeah. Uh, so. I couldn't go anywhere. I, I would have to take the bus. I don't have a car, you know, yeah. either it's the bicycle or the bus. And how could I get on the bus? So I, I couldn't go anywhere. Um, was it like, a, 
I mean, I remember you saying, was it true? Like these these like important people were coming to your house and talking to your mother or your grandmother, wanting to meet you and yeah, yeah. They, they these are like the sons of those high cadre. You know, they would come and make you know a proposition. They. And then my grandmother would be the one that would be talking to them. I said, uh, she's not here. Even if I was there, you know, she, she would, my grandmother, uh, was a really great conversationalist and, uh, he, she knows how to chat people, chat with people and not offend them and befriend them. And so, uh, quite a, di quite a diplomat then. <laughs> yeah. She protected me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, quite a few of them became her friends. Um, you know, she she always protected me. She, my parents were into their own things. They, they had their own worries yeah. and their own careers and stuff. And so my grandmother was the one that protected but me. You, I remember you saying that you were spending so much time with her that, I mean, she was the one that introduced you to, is it the lingua phone, the English language? Yeah. I mean, all these foreign pictures because yeah. she traveled too, didn't she? She go, she went to school, or she traveled too. So and, and... She, yeah, she went. She went to uh, London in 1937. Yeah, for a few years, uh, when my grandfather was um, doing his postdoc work there. I see. I see. So, so now you know, um, you know this. You're like the biggest star in China now, right? <laughs> At 17, 18. How did that how did that slowly transition and have you go meet your parents in, in the US and, and how did that how, how did that come about? Your journey to the to, to America? Well, I already, you know, I always wanted to leave the profession. I never believed filmmaking or acting is a lifelong profession. It just it was fun to do, and I was glad I was doing it, but I was trying to leave it. So right after my first film, I actually, the Chinese examination, Gaokao uh, examination system was restored after the Cultural Revolution. So then I decided to join the examination to try to get into a college. I and see. Because I missed all the, I missed years, two years of school. Um, so I figured my English was a little bit better um, than others because they didn't at all study and I was studying a little bit. So I took the examination and I got into Shanghai Foreign Language Institute. And so I was studying English a little bit. The kind of English really is is you know taught all by Chinese teachers who've never really <laughs> spoken with a native English speaker themselves, uh, all from books. And so I was in the Foreign Language Institute, and my mother passed the examination to be sent to America. That was very early on. And so some of my schoolmates were like, oh, you study English, your mother is in China. Uh, you know, you should, you should go. I didn't even think of that. Um, but um, I talked to my mother about it and she thought that would be a good idea because that way I could leave acting and go to school. Because in China, I couldn't go to school. I, once I left Shanghai Film, uh, once I left uh, Foreign Language Institute, I started making Xiaohua. Then after Xiaohua, there were some other invitations to do other movies. I would be in and out of classroom, and it was just quite impossible to finish school. But I mean, but the, the silver lining was because you were kind of acting and in between and trying to finish school that you that you were not one of the the, the, the kids that got sent down right yeah because everyone I, else was sent yeah, down I mean because I I started acting when I was 
14. So I, I went to this studio when I was 14. So I missed that being, you, I missed graduation from high school. That's when you get sent down. Yeah. Well, okay. some get sent down actually right after middle school, but um, most in Shanghai, they would get, they would be sent down after high school. Can, can you explain to people about sent down? I mean, some people don't know the whole uh, concept about that. Just very quickly. For 10 years um, from 1966 to 1967. Um, no, 1966 to 1976. I think the last group of people being sent down was probably 77. And then slowly after 77 they slowly stopped but um earlier on most high school graduates would be sent down to remote areas to be re-educated um so they would have to leave the city in life you know the, the stories came back from these remote those remote areas um uh, or were pretty horrible so we we didn't want to go. I see. I mean, I'm bringing this up because later on I got to, you know, <laughs> yeah. it, it kind of ties in at the end. So, um, yeah. So, Joan, like now, you know, I understand uh, that, that you you uh, enrolled at uh, Northridge, Cal State Northridge. Yeah. When I first yeah. came to the United States, I went to New York State University for one semester. And then um, Northridge, Cal State Northridge had there were three or four Chinese professors. Yeah. There were physics professors. And um, it was warm, it was warmer too, right? <laughs> yeah. And 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 they 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 actually borrowed films from the Chinese consulate in Los Angeles and had a Chinese film festival in the school. And so out of the four films, there were two uh, starring me. And so they somehow tracked me down in New York and invited me to California. And so I finished one semester in New York and came to California and didn't want to leave. It was just much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> it's that California weather, you know, you can't, I mean, people don't get it un until you go to California, you know, it's like, I mean, from New York, come on, it's a no brainer. Um, and, and, and when, of course, when you were enrolled there, I think you were doing TV, was it majoring in TV? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's broadcast TV film. It's what they call the communications. I see. Radio so, TV film. Yeah. So so I'm like trying to imagine this. Like here you are, like the most famous little girl, you know, in, in China. And then you're like suddenly a nobody in Northridge. How did you feel? And did, 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 did some of the Chinese people there recognize you? Like, oh, that's a Xiao Ha actress. That's Chen Chong. That's Chen. I mean, how, how did you like, how did your head, how did you get around that, you know? getting all the attention and then I mean there were Chinese students who were really excited to meet me um they, they were from China and so so they know um there were a few um Chinese students there it was very nice I I really enjoyed not being like famous and not not carrying that bearing that cross it was meaningless to me and yeah. so it was, it was very nice. It was nice to just have to um, um, learn to make a living and make ends meet and go to school, be a normal girl. So uh, I, I enjoyed that time very much. Yeah, this um, and, and from then, obviously, you were still dabbling and, and, and acting a bit. Right. Although you wanted to quit it or you wanted to quit acting or because you wanted yeah, to quit, you to quit acting. Actually, yeah. it wasn't entirely sincere. Yeah. Um, I just believed I should quit. But I think filmmaking is a lot of fun. Everybody who's ever made it wants to continue to do it, you know. So um, I kind of lied to myself, I think. I, But... Um, I must have missed it. <laughs> so the first uh, three years in college in the United States, I was doing like waiting on table. I didn't even get to wait on tables. I was the reception girl in a Chinese restaurant. Yeah. I worked in the library. 
I'll babysat a little bit. Uh, people couldn't believe that I, I, I was this most famous Chinese actress, you know, I was like, like on in everybody's house on their calendars. And um, there I was, I was babysitting and working in the library in school library and, and uh, being the reception girl at a Chinese uh, restaurant. Um, I had a schoolmate and uh, she was slightly older, like a year, a couple of years older than me or one year older than me. And I'm already a year or two older than the other students. Um, so we kind of uh, uh, felt that we are too mature a person that we made friends. And then she worked as a stunt woman in Hollywood, like motorcycles, horses and stuff. And so mm -hmm. wanted to finish her degree and work at the same time. And, and I um, told her that I used to be an actress and she said, oh, why don't you try? I said, I never thought about it. And so you should try, you should find an agent. And um, back then it's doing research is not as easy as now. Um, but I found out there was an agency that um, um, that represented all the Asian faces. I see. And so it's called Bessie Lou Agency back then. And so I took the bus from Northridge to Hollywood, like what, hour and a half or something like yeah. that. <laughs> In the jam, <laughs> like four or five jam. Ridiculous, you know. Um, and went to meet uh, Bessie by then, who started the agency, uh, already retired. So there was an agent by the name of Guy Lee. And I knocked on the door. I walked in, and um, he looked at me. I said, I, I have experience. And he's like, oh, yeah, OK. Um, never believed anything I said. <laughs> <laughs> And he said, well, just give me a picture. He, he looked me up and down and just, just give me a picture. You know, um, I said, what picture? He said, well, I will give you the name of a photographer and um, you pay him and you get a picture made. And so, you know, after I worked in the restaurant a little bit longer, I, I got the money and I paid uh, to get my picture taken and send it to Guy Lee. <laughs> that is this um you know obviously that worked out a bit i mean i you know i mean we all know that uh, your i think what one of your first major roles was was taipan right with brian brown oh yeah no but that 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 was you know like i i had to do all sorts of stuff before that um yeah i did yeah. a couple of smaller films i just was, was reading yeah, that was one you know when 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 people kind of like you were kind of introduced you know on a on a bigger screen yeah. I guess uh, yeah and everyone you know we all saw that film and 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 after that uh, you know of course slowly you know the, the the amazing last emperor how did that how did the last emperor um come about and how did they find you Joan the cast I remember the casting director I thought met you way before or something or how how did that how, how did that happen. So um, the casting director for The Last Emperor, uh, Joanna Merlin, um, she was also the casting director for Year of the Dragon. And um, so I was 22 when Year of the Dragon was casting. And um, kind of, you know, you know, fresh off the boat kind of look completely <laughs> wrong for the part. The part is a newscaster, a much more sophisticated uh, person. But when I heard of it, I was so determined. I said, you know, once in a lifetime, there is a there is an Asian female lead in the film. And um, I must have it. So I went to the audition and obviously I was everything wrong about it, but there was something in me that Joanna Merlin really liked that she thought special. 
So she always kept calling me back and asked me if I could uh, take English class to, um, to get better, become a native speaking person um, in a couple of months. And so I tried, I hired a speech coach and, um, but it's not something you could do in two months. <laughs> no, yeah, I, <laughs> so, I tried really, really hard. And so the casting director was so good to me. You know, she would pick out the most dramatic scenes from other famous movies like uh, Chinatown, um, uh, Faye Dunaway's scenes, uh, to have me do these dramatic scenes instead of this newscasting yeah. scenes for the director, just trying to keep me there. And so in the end, I had a screen test with Mickey Rock. So I was what, like, what, what, what was he like? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I shot Mickey before. So I, I, <laughs> I only, um, you know, I was only doing a screen test. Okay. So it wasn't, um, I didn't have to, um, I didn't get a chance to really um, know him in, in the real sense. Okay. Uh, so we just did the scene, but I think he was a little bit, he knew I wasn't the one. Yeah. So he just like yeah. very cavalierly. Um, Remember the girl they got was Ariane, right? She was kind yeah. of, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, she was a model before or something, or I remember. Yeah, so entirely, completely different. Yeah, you know, I was twenty-two, and I felt like you know, you looked at my picture at twenty-two. I looked probably more like eighteen. You know. Okay. Um, but that was Joanna Merlin who kept me for all this time, oh. all the way to like uh, screen test. And as a matter of fact, that was the only time. I got a the largest bouquet of flowers from Michael Cimino when he said, "No, I can't work with you." Yeah, for the year of the dragon. Yeah, for the year of the dragon. Yeah. Actually, yeah. you know, you don't get parts all the time. You go audition yeah. and you may not get it. But they actually knew they they had, you know, tortured me, <laughs> and. Um, yeah, sent me the flowers and, and I was like, oh no, I'm gonna stop doing this. I'm never gonna act again. This this is horrible. That you work so hard and it's like three months of your life and they cast someone else. But um, obviously that is not true. Joanna Merlin uh, became the casting director for um, Bernardo Bertolucci. They went around the world to cast but Joanna said the first thing to Bernardo is that I have your Empress. Wow. That, that's a pretty good one. So it's <laughs> look no further. Who, let me see. Like when she said that, who who were the other, um, I'm sure like who were, who were the other um, Asian actresses they were, they were considering? I mean, I mean, at that time, oh, the landscape no, they was... Were, like they were going around the world. They were looking everywhere everybody um any names any big names that we know or i don't i don't know i see but they they would be casting in europe they would be casting in china in taiwan in hong kong they would be casting everywhere and then they would come back so i met with bernardo um and then like three months later he would come back to Los Angeles and we would have coffee together. I see. And so it always came back to me. I mean, it's kind of ironic, right, Joan? I mean, here you are, you know, from China, you're based in LA and they're looking for a Chinese empress. They, they have to find this Chinese empress in Los Angeles. But that, yeah. that's life, right? I mean, uh, and and then did you, did you know, I mean, I mean, obviously when you got the part, did you know that this this was going to be a big film because it's like the first film ever shot in a forbidden city by anyone? I mean, let alone foreigners. 
like you know, like Bernardo and of course the great the great cinematographer Vittorio Storaro, you know, who did I, I was now. very excited. I was really yeah, excited. yeah, really you excited. could feel it and just I mean you knew these are huge directors, or did you know Bernardo or did you know Vittorio Storaro? I mean, what was your or was just going like okay, I need this because I want to be the Empress, it's gonna be a big film. Did you know all these? Yeah, I didn't I I mean I later on looked up uh Bernardo Bertolucci's films. Yeah. Um uh, and later on, I, I did all that, but during the time, I didn't know, you know, what a great crew cast. All the department heads are the best in their field, and I did not realize that, but I just knew this, Just I just had an inkling that this was going to be such a beautiful film. Um, Bernardo was in love with China um, back then, and every time she he he went to China, he would come back to LA. He would talk to me, um, yeah. And he he was such a well-read person. He would talk to me about Lao Tzu. He would talk wow. to me about Lu Xun. He would talk to me, and he would put me to shame that I didn't read these things. And I I am Chinese, and I would go and try to please him i would go go read them right away i see yeah. what's what's this tell me about this photograph jack nicholson bernardo and you oh i think jack nicholson was um entertaining bernardo in his house and so uh we were all invited to go yeah i see i see i remember very well what he told me jack yeah. <laughs> Yes, no. Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he said to me, he said, "Oh, it doesn't matter that you don't speak perfect English. Movies are not about that. It's not about that. It's not at all about that." And so that was like that helped you a lot. <laughs> yeah, this um, like how like how, like. I mean, I can just only imagine because I mean, I, I still kick myself that I never met you then, you know, but we met after that. And, um, you know, you're like, you're seeing these crews and thousands of extras. I mean, you guys had, a, I mean, a huge amount of extras. For the yeah. film. And, and you're like there alone in, Forbid I mean, what was it like, like cycling around? I mean, Forbidden City alone, you, you know, before you were shooting. I mean, because you never, uh, it, it was just, and did you know a lot about Pui before the story or did you just... No, I didn't know a lot about Puyi. I read Puyi's uh, autobiography and I read Johnston's book of, of his years in the Forbidden City after I was hired. Yeah. I see. This, uh, like, with that, I mean, like, when you're done with the film, I mean, the film won nine Oscars, right? Mm -hmm. It won nine Oscars. And um, when you're done with it, and you got this huge film and they want these Oscars. Did you feel that, okay, I've arrived. I'm a big movie star again. You know, like, what was your feeling? Like, the moment you were done with that, or were you looking for bigger and better things? Or, or what was your mindset? I mean, then. Because you were a big movie star already in China. And then now you're doing it again in, in America. I didn't, um, I think I was very much of a, um, um, I don't know. I'm, I, I, I wasn't so focused on my career. I was more focused on my life, but when that when that happened, um, I was just going through a lot in my life because the the cultural shock was slowly catching up on me. I that, see. That, that my life was sort of a mess, so I was dealing with my life, and when finally uh, the last emperor um, came um, became a success, I was just divorced. I see. And so I had to deal with my life. Um, I did feel a lot of attention. A lot of major fashion um, magazines uh, wanted to um, have my picture and, you know, stories. So th they all came looking for me. So that was, you know, only, you know, like last a few months and then i think if you if i wasn't you know chinese uh 
my career would have taken off. I see. Well, at that time there was you're you're the new you're the new you know female lead, a fresh female lead. Um, but I think the studios really had difficulties um, casting me. They had no idea. I mean, you know, there weren't any more empresses from China. Yeah. And so the the you know they didn't know how to basically use me. Yeah, so and, you pretty much were the loner there, and uh, I mean, I mean, to us here in Asia, you know, at that time, you know, I was really back in Singapore, and you know, we were so proud. We were like, whoa! I mean, you were like the biggest Asian actress, and and you know, lead, and, and it made a mark. Um, and that that uh, like I say, to to this day, I still kick myself because I never met you then. I hope you know, you know, I was wanted. I mean, I still look at the film, you know, and the sets, and and, and I wish I met you then. But you know it's okay because when you landed up in Singapore, right? When you landed up in Singapore, and after the Last Emperor, um, you you cut your hair, and you were sitting in the bar. <laughs> Sorry, you're sitting in the jazz bar. In the jazz uh, bar. In yeah. the jazz bar. We got to say that the jazz bar where they played Miles Davis and John Coltrane, not just any bar. Um, that was actually you know one of the most memorable moments for me. I mean, for me, that changed actually changed my life. You know, I mean, and I told you, I tell you these things all the time. Um, I just wanted to tell people, and people kind of know, like we know each other for for so long. It was actually that that meeting when you came for the Singapore Film Festival, and, and my friend behind you, he was staring at. He was like, "Okay, that's Joe." So he calls me up. My my old schoolmate calls me up, and, and I was in bed already. I was in bed, like watching TV or watching football. I said, "No, you gotta come here." I said, "Why?" Because Joan Chan is sitting in front of me with a bunch of people. So at that time, I just got back right from from Los Angeles, and I was looking for a person to to be on my poster of my my first exhibition in Singapore. Um, so of course, I put my clothes on. I, I I took off with one promo card and a business card, and I went look. I went looking for you. <laughs> so I said to my friend, and I went up to you. Um, I was a bit terrified, right? Because you know you were then already a huge movie star. You know, and um, yeah, and handed you. I still remember this, and you were really sweet. I handed you my my promo card and say, "Hey, look, I love to photograph you for my show a poster." And you were really, you were really sweet. You didn't, you didn't like think I was some freak or something. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, so that that was how that was how that was how we met. And 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 I, I want to ask, you know, like like what did you think when this kid came out? I mean, to like. Here you go. That's my photograph, and I was like, "What did you think?" And 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 how did you make a decision to? I think you have like a really good personality. Uh, you know, you know how to um, present yourself really well, and you know what you want. You know, you you know what you want in a photograph. You know what you. Um, you. I think other people may have also approached me that I just brushed them off and maybe it's faded Russell yeah I know I mean I think about uh, it so it's it's because I you know first of all I sell them because I don't drink I've never you know I I, I don't drink and I don't go to bars <laughs> and so very very rarely but you, but I, you go to jazz bars so that's okay I mean even jazz bars are you know like once in not, I, know not, not, I know you're not a night person and you don't really go out. So yeah, that, that, I don't you know. go out. I and so in a way it's interesting, you know, just I thought it was a chance meeting. I, I didn't know you actually got dragged out of your bed to, <laughs> to come with the to come with the purpose, but I thought it was a chance meeting. And then I was like, this like in a bar, and now we've had a lifelong time friendship. So. Yeah, I know, I know. And then, you know, obviously when I went back, because then I was already out, I was living in Singapore, right? So I think when I went back and and my friend or uh, agent said, a Miss Chen called to leave a message and she wants to shoot with you. I just about fell on my chair. I didn't know who a Miss Chen was because I didn't know you as Miss Chen, right? And you as Joan. So yeah, and we met up. We met up and we, 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 sh we shot for the first time and I didn't have a studio because I was a broke student still. And we shot in my friend's backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, and and uh, I still love these photos. Be yeah, good. so yeah. you know, that's that's like the. I mean, to me, that's one of my favorite favorite portraits I ever done. You know, and when we when we photographed, 
uh, and this was the first time you ever shot, right? This is yeah. right after, and you had short hair. You had really short hair. Yeah. You, you yeah. chopped it off right after the, the Last Emperor. No, I did a movie. I did a movie that, I I, yeah, I did a movie. And, and back then, I already did Twin Peaks. Yeah. So, ah. yeah. I, oh, I see. Oh, you did Twin Peaks then. Okay. So that was already Twin Peaks. Oh, so, yeah, it was 1990. Mm -hmm. already yeah so i mean and and through the years obviously we shot so for so, so many times and and this was actually the obviously the first shoot that i still go back to that i still love the, the images we created you know um yeah this uh john what what was uh so like when you when you when you're mentioning about twin peaks you know again you know that was i mean to me when when you got the part for twin peaks again you know it it affected me, you know, and I'll tell you later on. But but more importantly, like I think for the movies, I mean, you reached out to a certain audience. People saw you worldwide, and but the movie goes. But I think for Twin Peaks, for domestically, for their, your local American, I mean, you were introduced to them in their homes. Yeah. yeah. And right. So that made you more a household name, I guess. Yeah. When you, when you played Josie Packard, you know, the yeah. sawmill owner, and it was yeah. it was great. Everyone rushed home to watch it because they couldn't tape it unless they had, they had no TiVo then. Um, yeah, okay, I mean, well, interesting. How was it? How was it that you got the part with David Lynch? I mean, how did David find you? I think the part was written for Isabel Rossellini. Oh, uh, so okay. the part was written Italian. Uh, so so when he, I, when he was I, dating her then, right? Wasn't he? They just broke up or something. Oh, okay. Because I knew he was dating him, her. Yeah. I think. Uh, so the part was written Italian, and so when I first read the script, the part was written Italian. And um, it's like the, the blue velvet in a way that there is this one mysterious outsider in a very incestuous small town. Mm -hmm. um, so this mysterious exotic element. So it was Italian, but now it's Chinese. And, and, and like when he asked you, I remember you saying like you had a very smart answer for him, right? When he was asking you. What did I say? <laughs> you said you said you said something like like uh like oh did you know that this was for a for an uh, for Italian woman, and then I think you said something you told me like something like oh I cook Italian is that good enough for you or something like that? Yeah, no, I I was <laughs> it was a very good meeting. I think yeah yeah that 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 meeting. I I wish I wrote diary. I remember it was a very enjoyable meeting. I hate. I hate auditions. I, I don't enjoy meetings and I did enjoy very much meeting with him. And to to know that he could use me well. I see. Okay. This um right after that, I mean, you know, you you're you're, you're there acting and you and you know, red rose and white rose. I would see you in China, right? You know, we would shoot, and you did Red Rose, White Rose. You won Best Actress, and you're doing films. And one thing, what you did was you you, you kind of still straddled between China, and Asia, and you would go back to the U.S. Um, what what was it that made you want to go direct a film? I mean, that was your, your Siu Siu film. Yeah. You know, after all well, this time, this was yeah. in 98, right? Yeah. So I started directing. I was 36, and that was the time when I no longer was the exotic flower. This beautiful exotic young thing so um we're nearly uh, there joan <laughs> yeah. well uh so um it was becoming a drudgery it was like these stupid parts that i i'm offered to do and uh, i like film i like acting i like film more than just making it stupid movies or stupid parts and the parts were really becoming very unsatisfying um and i was a judge on the berlin film festival that was 1999 or something 1998 1998 yeah and um i saw some movies that i felt inspired i also saw it was like the end of the millennium type of film um that i felt was meaninglessly dark and then i thought i could i 
I felt some people were making it. They didn't seem to have a story to tell that year. Um, and I felt I had a story to tell. So um, after being a jury that year, on the flight back, I just the 12 hours, I sort of finished show show script. I see. I remember, you know, you were on the way to China. And I remember, I still remember you like rolling around in, in the guest room. Yeah, so I, 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 came to, yeah. I came to Singapore to look for money and I stayed in I your house. And looking, yeah. you know, I was still like revising the script and trying to come up with a proposal. And you introduced me to someone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Some people and then we're trying to, you know, help you get the funding. And uh, yeah, it was just, and that this was before, obviously, before you went to China, before you you did all yeah. your research, right? Yeah, because you just you totally just disappeared after that. We never saw you because this was like undercover shooting, right? And uh, I mean, it won all the awards, the seven Golden Horse Awards, and 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 um, you know, I mean, you know, you made a pretty slam as a director, and it was just, you know, to me when I saw the film, it was so, I mean, being a photographer, you know, I just looked at the imagery. You know why? What was it that made you take that approach? Where I mean, there was hardly any speaking. I mean, very very thin script. But but the imagery was so image driven. You know, I mean, as a cinematographer, photographer, it was it was amazing. It was just an amazing film for me to to, to watch. But then, why did that, how did you go about like you know deciding? I think that, like, that is the type of film I like. I th I think um, uh, a lot of dialogues going back and forth is more like for television series or for for uh, stage. I think cinema itself requires few dialogue. That's my belief. And, and that's the type of movies that I like, that you don't have to say a lot. Um, and these two people, they don't have much to say to each other. When old Tibetan horsemen and a young girl from Chengdu being stranded and forgotten in a remote region. They really don't have a lot to speak to each other about. Yeah, so that was that would really, you know. And once I once I went there though, I was going to shoot somewhere else because I didn't want to shoot a guerrilla film. Yeah. Uh, but once I the original story was written by Yan Geling and and where we shot was where the story happened. And once I got there, I knew I couldn't do it anywhere else. It's that piece of sky, it's that piece of yeah. grassland and the curves um, of the land. Um, it was, the film was born to me when I saw it. Um, so I had to do it illegally because I wanted to do it right there. It was the right place. I mean, you paid a, a small price. On once you banned, you said you were banned for a couple of years. And I was banned for three years, yeah. Yeah, for that, but it was worth it. <laughs> I mean, that was a beautiful piece of work, John. Thank this, you. Uh, do you need to go now, or you can just? <laughs> no, we do. We do part two. We do part two. Like late, um, later at a later point. This is just half your life, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I get. Uh, I sometimes get talkative, and I. You should stop me, and then. Wow. This is what I want. I mean, this I told you in hours. Like it's just like that. You go, oh, what are we gonna talk about? Well, your life, you know. I mean, this is, this is only Siu Siu. You know, this is only 1998. <laughs> no, but well, I'll, I'll I'll buzz you again. We'll chat. You know, I know I know you gotta go. I have an appointment. And yeah. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do part two, and we'll get it. We'll get it done again. You know. But it's always nice to I chat with you. Nice talking to you. Yeah, Jones. So take care. Say hi to everyone, and uh, yeah, and 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 stay safe. You know. Okay. And I will, 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 I'll get back to you real soon. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Joan. Bye. Bye. So that was Joan Chen. Um, I knew this was this is gonna be a two part thing, you know, because she had to go. Um, but I'm gonna hit her up, hit her up, up again because we just we we just only until 1998, you know, because she's got such a lustrous career, and and I'll be hitting her up again, and uh, we, we'll we'll get part two done. But thanks a lot. I know thanks for hanging out here and and just chatting over here in this morning or this evening wherever you are. And we'll 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 chat soon. And and thanks for all your questions. You know, we'll get we'll get back to you because she was just rambling on, man. <laughs> but it's good. Thanks thanks so much, guys. And and I look forward to more.
you know, real soon. We'll be talking to Joan real soon. Thanks.